wind up saying about power and perspectivism. Um, Nietzsche's after knowledge. The book is after certain kind of truth. Um, he's after a certain kind of knowledge that he thinks we've previously been lacking. And it's something that it's actually difficult to acquire. And it's not deep metaphysical truths about <coughs> other worlds. It's the most mundane but difficult kind of truths to acquire about ourselves. Section two. The subject, he says, of this, what he calls polemic, um, concerns is the very bottom of uh, page one on the two. He's concerns, he says, the thoughts on the origins of our moral prejudices. Um, why are these prejudices? possible here, 
Um, but it's honorable. It's something that he's praising. It's something that he hopes he finds within himself, even if he's a little worried about it. It's a hard thing to do. And this continues. He says, look, the end of that section. Um, the last, last line, he says, and do they take the, the products of this um, investigation? Do they taste good to you, these fruits of ours? But what concern is that to the trees? Of what concern is that to us, us philosophers? Okay, so we philosophers, you should say, should only care about whether their act, the, the, our products, our work, is accurate whether it's true, whether it constitutes genuine knowledge, whether what we say, what we produce, is useful or comfortable, or whether anyone prefers to hear these thoughts or not, irrelevant. Philosophers need to remain disciplined. Philosophers need to remain focused on precision and accuracy, not comfort and popularity. Okay, so he claims then, section three, um, to have started really as a child asking about the origins of the idea of good and evil. And initially, his answer was that it came from that, that, that good and evil come from God, and he worries a little bit that that this is his prejudice, namely uh, prejudice against the idea of God. Um, so, as I say, maybe his investigation isn't quite as clean and isn't quite um, as pure as it goes. But he soon stopped looking, he says, pages two to three, very bottom of the page. Um, he says he soon stopped looking for the origin of evil behind the world, like in another transcendental metaphysical place, because there is no behind the world. Uh, so he, uh, sorry, so uh, he said, stop looking um, for the origin of evil behind the world. A little historical and philological schooling soon transformed my problem into a different one. Namely, under what conditions did man invent those value judgments, good and evil? And what value do they themselves have? Have they inhibited or furthered human flourishing up until now? Are they signs of distress, of impoverishment, of the degeneration of life? Or, conversely, do they betray the fullness, the power, the will of life, its courage, its confidence, its future? Um, OK, so first thing about this passage is, first thing was, there's not some other world where we can find what's good and evil. It's this world, and we can trace the natural history of the development of these ideas, of this system of value. Second, notice that there are different questions here. Under what conditions did man invent those value judgments, good and evil? And what value do they themselves have? Again, I mentioned this last time, Nietzsche is not committing a genetic fallacy. There are two different questions. How does a certain idea emerge? And uh, what's the value of that idea? Um, on the other hand, a good genealogy is going to open up the question of evaluation in a way that wasn't visible before, might not have been visible. So in other words, uh, if we thought that the moral system of values is inevitable, is pure, is given by God, is permanent, is a non-human creation, then we might not question it. If, on the other hand, we see that it has a history and that there are rivals, then we'll be in a position to ask whether it's a good thing whether it's something to continue to affirm or not. And, of course, uh, I'll skip over to section five then. This is his real concern. It's not with the history itself, but with an evaluation of the current 
moral system of values. Um, okay, so the issue, he says, just about the middle of the page, he says, in particular, the issue was the value of the unegoistic of the instincts of compassion, self-denial, self-sacrifice. Precisely the instincts that Schopenhauer had gilded, deified, and made otherworldly until finally they alone were left for him as the values in themselves. Um, actually, if you can continue. But precisely against these instincts, there spoke from within me an ever more fundamental suspicion, an ever deeper delving skepticism. Precisely here, so, so here he's identifying the value of the unegoistic, compassion, self-denial, self-sacrifice. Those are moral ideals. These are what's affirmed by morality. And precisely here, in morality, those values, I saw the great danger to humanity, its most sublime lure and temptation. And into what, he asks? Into nothingness? Precisely here I saw the beginning of the end, the standstill, the backward glancing tiredness the will turning against life, the last sickness gently and melancholically announcing itself. I understood the ever more widely spreading morality of compassion, that's the moral system of values, as the most uncanny symptom of our now uncanny European culture, as, it, as its detour, he asked, to a Buddhism, to a Buddhism for Europeans, to an italics, nihilism, Okay, so, uh, the moral system of values based on, which affirms centrally and primarily the idea of um, self-denial, of um, the unegoistic, of self-sacrifice, of compassion, uh, the morality of pity, is something that Nietzsche sees and worries about leading to nihilism. And I mentioned last time the connection to the collapse of Christian metaphysics here. Um, but what we'll do next time is talk a little bit more about this idea of compassion, finish up quickly uh, the uh, preface, and get started talking about the first essay. <coughs>